I'm Bob Wilhelm, the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development. With this being the, the university's 150th anniversary, I'm also pleased to announce that we're going to be offering Nebraska lectures every month this year to celebrate uh, all of the, the uh, all through the anniversary year. Uh, and many of these lectures will be focusing on both university and state history. So I hope you'll be able to make plans to come and join us a few more times for these future le lectures and celebrate the University of Nebraska-Lincoln uh, in our heritage in this great state. The Nebraska lectures are an interdisciplinary lecture series that are designed to bring together uh, both the university community but also with the greater community in Lincoln. I'm glad to see we have many different people here today. Thank you for being with us. Uh, and to bring people together and celebrate the intellectual life of the University of the Nebraska at Lincoln. And the pre presentations highlight our faculty's excellence in research and creative activity. This lecture series is sponsored by the UNL Research Council in co cooperation with the Office of the Chancellor. Thank you, Chancellor. And also the Office of Research and Economic Development and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, which is known as OLLI. Uh, a special welcome I, I want to make to all of the, or for any OLLI members that are here today. And I'd like to uh, recognize OLLI members. We're able to have a much richer and, a, and just a bigger lecture series this, uh, this year, in particular uh, due to the support of Humanities Nebraska. And I want to thank their executive director, uh, Chris Summerick, for helping sponsor this year's lectures. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. We'll also be creating podcasts to archive each of the lectures this year, uh, and we'll be archiving these. So, uh, archiving podcasts, it's a, it's a new thing. Uh, and uh, so that new audiences in the future will be able to, to both enjoy these, uh, these uh, lectures, but also to learn more about the people, the places, and the events that have played significant roles in our state's history. Uh, so in, in coming months, you'll hear more from us about all the details of the podcast and, and where you'll be able to find them. Um, I also want to recognize the university's research council which includes faculty from a broad range of disciplines uh, at the University of Nebraska. Uh, the council solicits nominations of, of faculty to present at these Nebraska lectures, and then uh, based on the, their major accomplishments and also their ability, lecturer's ability to explain uh, their work. Uh, the selection of the Nebraska lecture is a recognition from the University Research Council. It's really the highest recognition that the faculty make uh, in the council. So I'd like to thank again the University Research Council. And I want to clap for that too. So I've got a, a few different operational details to cover uh, before we get started. The lecture today is going to be web, web stream live and so I want to welcome anyone that is here that's joining us online and through Facebook live. live. And for social media users we have a hashtag for today's lecture and it's hashtag NEB lecture, so NEB lecture. Uh, a, few, a few more words about the uh, format. Uh, after the lecture, we'll also have some time uh, for a question and answer session uh, with the audience, and we'll have a moderator uh, here with us to lead that. Uh, following the Q&A session, and this is part of my contract coming in as the vice chancellor, I'm the, I'm the master of prizes, uh, we will be offering a prize, and that prize today uh, we'll announce the winner of an N150 book. You may have seen some of the, the N150 books that on your way in. Uh, you have to be here to be, you have to be present to win. Uh, so look forward to the, to the prize event uh, at the end of the lecture and at the end of our question and answer section. Uh, and uh, as well, once we're finished here, we also will have a reception set up and so we'll be able to, to talk more with the speaker and maybe visit with the friends that you see here. So now let me please welcome uh, help me to please welcome Chancellor Ronnie Green, who will introduce our speaker. You got you. Well, thank you very much, Bob, um, and it's great to see everyone here at the WIC Center today. Uh, and on behalf of the Alumni Association, welcome to their beautiful facility here on our campus. Um, as Bob said, uh, we are taking a different approach during this 150th anniversary year that we're now into this month in 2019. 
um, by having an expanded series of the Chancellor's Lectures, of the Nebraska Lectures. Um, and Chris, I again thank uh, Humanities Nebraska and the, the National Endowment for the Humanities that are helping us to bring these lectures to the campus and to the greater community in this way to celebrate the year. It's a great town and gown kind of thing for us here in, in Lincoln and beyond and throughout the state. And it is a real privilege today, in the first of these, to introduce our speaker to you, who I think many of you in the room uh, here on campus know very well uh, from her history in Nebraska over a long period of time and, and her history on our faculty and through Ollie, as you'll hear uh, in the introduction today. Our speaker today is Charlene Behrens. Uh, Dr. Behrens is an Emeritus Professor of Journalism in our College of Journalism and Mass Communications. And we're very happy, it says here on my script, to have you back on campus, but Charlene, I don't think you ever really left um, campus um, uh, from your former position. And she's going to have the opportunity to share some insights at, a, again, a timely time about our unicameral and about our single house legislature here in Nebraska as they are now underway with their work in the long session of their, their uh, 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 set of the unicameral's work. Charlene's a journalist at heart and she's passionate about sharing her knowledge of First Amendment rights and freedom of expression. Uh, she taught an honors seminar on these topics when she was on our faculty and always urged her students in her reporting and editing classes to strive for both truth and accuracy. She's an award-winning educator, having earned the Fre Freedom Forum Journalism Teacher of the Year honor, a UNL College Award for Distinguished Teaching. She was also named Outstanding Educator of the Year by the Association of Students of the University of Nebraska and Lincoln. When Charlene joined the university faculty, first in 1995, she brought 14 years of experience as editor and co-publisher of the Seward County Independent, one of Nebraska's great community newspapers here just to our west. She also pursued and earned a PhD in political science, adding a new dimension to her scholarly pursuits. Charlene's interest in the political process, along with her background as a journalist, helped her become an expert on Nebraska's unicameral legislature and many of the state's political figures through that study as well. For any newcomers in the room, I think most of us here are familiar with the fact that we have this kind of unique one-body legislature in Nebraska, the only state in the country that has a nonpartisan one-house legislature where the founders of that system envisioned creating a governing body that was more transparent to the public and less susceptible to the partisan politics of the era. Charlene's written two books about the unicameral. The first, entitled Power to the People, explored the role populism and prog progressivism played in this bold vision for our state's government. The second, entitled One House, offers perspective on whether the unicameral has actually lived up to that definition as a one house nonpartisan legislature. She also is author of Chuck Hagel, Moving Forward, a biography of our former U.S. Senator and U.S. Secretary of Defense, who was just on campus here recently this past fall, along with numerous other pieces on the political process of journalism. Uh, Charlene retired in, 19, in two, uh, 2014 from the university, but as I said earlier, she's remained very active on campus. Um, in fact, has trailed me around a couple of times writing stories and is very active in the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, as we mentioned earlier. It's now my honor to introduce to you our colleague Charlene Behrens, who will present Nebraska's unicameral, still progressive after all these years. And she tells me that's a play off Paul Simon. So Charlene, welcome. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's wonderful to see so many of my UNL friends here and my Ollie friends and some of you who fall into both of those subsets. It's just um, delightful that you came to hear this 
presentation today. I don't know if you noticed where this little announcement ended up in today's paper. It was collected with a few, with four other short items under a, a section called At a Glance. It was this event, a fire, and three crimes. <laughs> So with any luck, this will not be a crime here. It might be a crying shame, but it won't be a crime, I hope. Um, it's, it's interesting to me, too, that I do know so many of you, and I'm right here where I've spent a lot of time in the WIC Center and on campus, because usually an expert is somebody who comes from at least 50 miles away and is a stranger, right? So I was mentioning this to my husband, Danny, the other day, you know, this 50 miles away thing. He said, well, I could drive you out to Grand Island and back if that would help. I would take care of the 50 miles, but um, you know, it snowed, so we didn't do that. Um, at any rate, I'm happy to talk about the legislature. I'm always happy to talk about the legislature. I um, have been interested in this unique system we have here. Ever since I moved to Nebraska several millennia ago, I figured out I've spent about 75% of my life here in this state, and I'm happy about that. I'm, I'm almost a native Nebraskan. And I was happy that I had an excuse to study this legislature in some depth while I was in grad school and after. Um, I wrote two books, as the chancellor said. The first one, pretty theoretical. The next one, not so much. And you'll probably be relieved to hear that we're not going to talk deep theory here today. But we will talk a little bit of theory. Um, here's the first thing, though, that I want you to know. We have not always been like this. Nebraska entered the Union in 1867 with a traditional two-house legislature, and we didn't make the switch to one house until a vote of the people in 1934. The first session of the one-house unicameral was in 1937. It is not easy to make that kind of institutional change. Think about that. Changing the whole way your legislature is set up, the way your senators are elected, that's a big deal. So why did Nebraskans do that? Well, a one-house nonpartisan legislature didn't just spring full-blown from the soil of the Dust Bowl in Nebraska. Um, but it wasn't, I don't think, a huge political or social crisis. There certainly weren't people marching in the streets, you know, and demanding something different and better. Instead, I argue, it was an outgrowth of the populist and progressive philosophies that were major influences in the state from the 1880s on into the 1930s and still are around today to an extent and in, in some form. So what was or is populism? Here's a little bit of theory. Very briefly, populist theory asserts that an identifiable entity known as the people exists. This is different from Madison's idea of a whole bunch of individuals, you know, and we'll pit, excuse me, interest against interest until we come to some common good from the uh, result of that. Instead, populists believe in a very unitary people, the people, whose will should be carried out. And the people are pretty much everybody who isn't one of the few elites. It's a very majoritarian philosophy, and it's still a very popular philosophy in many ways, in somewhat different form. First, though, I want to take a quick march, and I mean that, quick march, through the history of some of our state uh, beginnings and our government's beginnings. Senator Stephen A. Douglas, known best for debating Lincoln in 1858, played an instrumental role in making Nebraska a state. The Transcontinental Railroad, Congress had been talking about that since the early 1840s, and Douglas, a senator from Illinois, wanted a northern route for the railroad so that it would connect to Chicago in his state. And that meant, if we we're going to have this railroad built, that we had to uh, organize the territory west of the Missouri as part of the United States. It was all part of the Louisiana Purchase, as you remember, from 1803. But west of the Missouri, we hadn't even organized it into territories yet, much less states. So in 1847, Senator Douglas introduced a bill to establish a Nebraska territory. Now, slavery had become a central issue in discussions about organizing territories, and it did have an effect here, too. 
But those details are for another time. There's not <laughs> enough time today. Let's just say that the Kansas-Nebraska Act finally was passed in 1854. The railroad began its construction in 1863, finished in, well, t in total in 1869 when the um, two parts of the railroad hooked together in, in Utah. So Nebraska became a territory in 1854 with a population of almost 2,800 people, almost. By 1862, though, even before the Homestead Act of that year, Nebraska was producing enough ag products to more than balance the value of the goods imported. That's a pretty good uh, economy we had going here. And the population grew rapidly. By 1867, it was about 50,000. Now, because we were a territory, our executive and judicial officers were appointed by the president. The legislature was popularly elected. Um, James Buchanan was the president at the time, and he was known for his pro-South and pro-slavery attitudes, and Nebraskans didn't like the officials that he was appointing. And their discontent boosted the Republicans' strength in the territory, but neither party was completely dominant. I think that's important to remember. From the start, neither party was way, way stronger than the other. And in fact, in the 1860 election, almost everybody in the territory supported Lincoln, no matter what party they were from. That same year, though, um, the voters defeated a proposal to form a state government. Four years later, the territorial legislature asked Congress to pass legislation making statehood possible. And that bill passed in Congress in April of 1864. So the next step towards statehood was for Nebraskans to convene a constitutional convention, which they did. They met on July 4th and adjourned almost immediately. They made no attempt to form a constitution. You can't have a state without some kind of document to tell you what's going to happen. In, so uh, we had to try again. In 1866, <clears throat> the Republicans in the territorial legislature pushed statehood via some unorthodox procedures like preparing a constitution and moving it through the legislature so fast that members never saw a copy. However, this was approved by the voters in June of 1866. Narrowly approved, but approved. Unfortunately, the document didn't include very many provisions at all for a functioning government. The primary goal seemed to be to make government as cheap as possible. I'm sure that's a shock to you, right? Um, well, regardless of all that, the Congress welcomed Nebraska into the Union on March 1, 1867 as the 37th state in the Union. And that's the date, of course, March 1st, that we celebrate every year as our statehood day. So, despite Nebraska's political struggles to even become a state, it didn't take its leaders long to figure out that the state needed to sponsor a college. Now, Congress had passed the Morrill Act in 1862, named after its sponsor, Justin Smith Morrill of Vermont. And you're probably aware, in general at least, that this enabled a grant from the federal government to provide land and funds for a college in each state. And they were known, logically, as land-grant colleges. The purpose of the schools was to teach the principles and skills related to agriculture and mechanical arts, but also to include other scientific and classical studies. In a quote from the language in the bill, it was to promote liberal and practical education, what we think of today as a university. So Nebraska situated its land-grant college on four city blocks in Lincoln, just a few blocks north of the capital that had been finished just the previous year. It was, you might say, a bold and audacious thing for the state to do. So with its capital building and its state college in place, Nebraska continued to grow. We were 250,000 in 1870. Ten years later, we were a million people. One big reason was the railroad. Um, the Union Pacific had been given 20 sections of land for each mile of track, 
<clears throat> and it sold the, the land at reasonable prices because, you know, what were they going to do with their trains if they didn't have customers? So they needed farmers, they needed communities. And they encouraged a lot of people to settle along the right-of-way. Another in big influence was the Homestead Act of 1862 that gave anybody who wanted it 160 acres if they would live on the land and farm it for five years, and then it would be theirs. Now, in the 1860s and 1870s, at the same time that Nebraska was being settled by white folks, farming was becoming mechanized and more commercial, and that was both a blessing and a curse. Farmers were at the mercy of fluctuating production and an unstable ag economy. And the state's heavy dependence on agriculture, plus that nearly useless constitution from 1866, made it really tough for state government to function. One big problem facing farmers was the land itself. Some of the land was submarginal. It didn't produce enough to cover the inputs needed for farming. And except in the sand hills, people across the state tried to use the same ag practices that worked only in the eastern third. In the actual sand hills, you know, what we now identify as that, they could see that wasn't going to work. But most of the rest of the state tried to farm the way people had farmed in Illinois and Iowa and in the eastern third of Nebraska. The situation led to cycles of boom and bust, and like just about anybody, anywhere, farmers were looking for somebody to blame, not themselves. Not the weather, not poor farming practices. Nebraskans were looking for villains and they found them. Railroads, mortgage lenders, speculators. Well, it was time, people began to say, to make the state's government a little bit more effective. And in 1871, a constitutional convention convened to write documents to do exactly that. But the railroads, pretty powerful, Union Pacific and Burlington Northern by this time, didn't like the potential regulations contained in this constitution, and they campaigned against it, and they defeated it. By 1875, state government was near chaos. So the leaders tried again. They wrote another constitution, still included some railroad regulation, but this time it passed by a 6-1 margin. And the railroads really wouldn't have had to worry because it turned out that passing legislation to regulate railroads was a lot easier than actually doing it, and not much really changed. Well, by the 1880s, the crops were pretty good. Land was available. Loans were really easy to come by. Anybody who pretty much wanted to could get a loan to buy land. <clears throat> The 1889 crop had been really good, but prices, of course, hit an all-time low. And the farmers thought, with some justification, that they were getting ripped off by bankers and grain elevators and especially those stinking railroads. Their discontent found a voice in the Farmers Alliance, which started out as a citizen lobby, but soon became a full-fledged political group. More than 800 people, delegates, at an alliance-sponsored convention in 1890 met at Bohannon's Hall in Lincoln, and the state's People's Party was born. This was populism. Populism people, right? People's Party, Populist Party. Nebraska's popul populism, I believe, was part of a movement that originated in the 1880s and 90s in the South to an extent, and in the Plain States, right here in the middle of the country. Farmers were struggling against drought, speculators, railroads, bank high-handedness. And remember, this was the Gilded Age. There were huge, huge disparities in wealth. This was the days of the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and the J.P. Morgans. Um, does this sound familiar, this huge disparity in wealth thing? Hmm, let's see. Um, but farmers, of course, were far better educated and better to communicate among themselves by this time than, than people had been in previous decades. Excuse me. And they began to rise up against what they saw as the tyranny of the minority, those few elites who they thought had all the money, all the power, all the control. They demanded that the government get involved more and provide for the good of the people and they turned to politics as a way to get that done. 
They did, in the late 1890s, get a few people elected to the state legislature and to Congress, but it didn't last very long, and it wasn't enough to make much of an impact. Nebraska's William Jennings Bryan was one of the most famous politicians to come out of the populist movement. But when he ran for president in 1896, it was as a Democrat because, by that time, the populist party had fused with the Democratic party. It gave them a bigger platform and a bigger voice for a while, but it was the end of the populists as a separate party. By the early 1900s, though, Republicans and Democrats seem to be competing with each other to implement a lot of the populists' goals, that government should represent the people. Both parties began to see a need for government regulation of industry and business in the interest of common folks. And progressivism picked up where populism left off. They still believed in a will of the people, but they added some specifics that government should specifically work in to improve the lot of the people, should be open to scrutiny by the people, experts and expertise should be put to work to that end, and importantly, parties and party bosses should just take a back seat to the experts and to the people. And it seemed to have an effect. Between 1901 and 1919, Nebraskans passed 10 constitutional amendments influenced by this progressive spirit. Um, the initiative and referendum in 1912, we were one of the first in, in states in the nation to do that. Woman suffrage in 1918, two years before the 19th Amendment was ratified and became federal law. We also adopted regulations on railroads and public utilities. We established a direct primary system and we passed some labor legislation um, work rules, our wage and hour rules, that kind of thing, and nonpartisan elections for the judiciary. Well, George Norris was a longtime representative and then senator from Nebraska, and he was for sure a progressive. And he had been agitating for a one-house nonpartisan legislature since the early 1920s. He wrote a long opinion piece in 1923 for the New York Times, and I mean long. It was like almost an entire big page in a broadsheet newspaper. In that piece, he denounced party politics and praised nonpartisanship. He said it would be a lot easier for the people to be the government in that case. It would make the legislature transparent, easy for people to follow, and to get involved. And that, he said, was the ultimate goal in a democracy. But it wasn't until 1934, 10 years later, that things really got rolling. In February that year, Norris and other Nebraskans met in Lincoln and kicked off the initiative petition drive, made possible by that 1912 amendment, right, to place the constitutional amendment on the ballot that fall. It would make the legislature a one house, nonpartisan body. And they promoted that on the basis of populism and progressivism. By the way, one of Norris's loyal co-conspirators, and in fact, his, really his right-hand person in this campaign, was John Sunning, who was chair of the UNL, or the NU, political science department at the time, and very involved, right after Norris, just as close as you could get. Well, here are the, some of the main points of their argument. They said, one house will be more open and straightforward and easier to follow. You couldn't have one house passing the buck to the other, which happens in two house legislatures. Um, you, couldn't ha you wouldn't have any more bills reconciled in conference committee where you know, one house passes a bill that's just a little different from the other. So a few people from each house get together in a conference committee, work out the details, and then put forth their solution to this with no more amendment, no more discussion, take it or leave it. So <clears throat> they Norris thought that the conference committees were probably the worst thing about a two-house legislature. These folks also said that if you made the legislature smaller, it would be easier to follow and a lot more accessible to the common person. The 1932 Nebraska legislature had consisted of 100 people in the House and 33 in the Senate. 
the amendment proposal set the total number between 30 and 50. It's a lot smaller. They also said that parties just get in the way of government by the people. They give too much power to the few who are the party bosses. And besides, Norris said straight out, the business of the state is in no sense partisan. That's a quote. Now, this nonpartisan thing was the point on which he got some argument, even from his fellow supporters of the amendment, because they were afraid it was too radical, that people would look at that and go, I don't know, can't vote for that. And it is true that nonpartisanship did get a lot of criticism. Not all, and some of it pretty thoughtful. Some noisy critics said that if you took away the party structure, special interests would have a heyday, and that would be even worse. And there, you know, you could make that argument. But Norris was not going to give in. He insisted nonpartisanship had to be part of the deal because parties got in the way, he said, of government by the people. So Norris and Senning and the others said that one house would be more responsive and responsible, more efficient, more businesslike. That meant hiring some experts for staff and paying legislators more, a lot more than they had been getting. And he even wrote into the amendment this total dollar figure of $37,500 to be divided by however many legislators we ended up with between 30 and 50. That proved to be um, a consequential decision to put that into the amendment. They also said that this new body would be more streamlined, able to move quickly to meet the needs of the people, and they said that lobbyists would have to do their work out in public and in the open where people could watch what was going on. They called this proposed institution the model legislature and they campaigned for it mightily. George Norris, who was 73 at the time, very young, right, my Ollie friends? Yes. Um, said that he nearly wore out his car driving back and forth across the state. A lot of critics attacked the plan, and the critics included almost all the newspapers in the state. And it looked as if this thing was just not going to make it. But when Election Day came, the amendment was approved by almost 60% of the voters. Now, two other amendments on the ballot also passed. One repealed prohibition, and the other one legalized parimutuel betting. And rumor had it that supporters of the other two measures urged people to just vote yes on everything, and that the unicameral was swept along with the uh, betting and the gambling and the drinking. But the unicameral passed with the largest margin of approval. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> Well, Nebraskans had made history. This is probably the most radical innovation in the history of American government. George Norris gets a lot of credit for this because Nebraskans admired and trusted him, and when he said this was a good idea, they were inclined to agree. One more thing. The idea was probably also appealing because it would be cheaper, this new legislature. Remember, this was the middle of the Great Depression, and any way to save money probably looked pretty good. But I reject the idea that that was the primary or only reason that people voted in favor. That idea has kind of been surfacing lately that, well, it's cheaper, that's why we passed it. No, I don't think so. I mean, Norris had been pro promoting this for more than 10 years, right? In lots of ways. And he never mentioned the cheaper part of it until they actually put the amendment on the, on the ballot. And by that time, you know, financial or economic circumstances in the nation had changed, and it seemed like an obvious thing to say in the middle of the Depression. Nebraskans also might have been influenced by the New Deal philosophies of innovation that were sweeping the nation in the early 30s as people looked for a way out of the mess of the Depression. Well, at any rate, the 1935 the last bicameral was legislature was charged with deciding how many members exactly the new unicameral would have and redistricting the state accordingly. They drew map after map. And remember, this was no computers. This was by hand. They figured different ways of dividing the state. And what they were looking for was a, a good balance between urban and rural representation. 
And they finally decided that 43 was the best way to do that at the time, in 1937. And those 43 senators met as a nonpartisan one house legislature for the first time in 1937. They set the rules for the legislature, as every legislature does set its own rules. But this group, when they started writing rules, they were as determined as Norris, that the, who wasn't, remember he was in Washington, he wasn't part of this group. Um, but the, they were just as determined as he had been that this body was gonna be open and accountable. So Nebraska was on its way to showing the rest of the nation what a progressive legislature looked like. But has it lived up to that? Is it still progressive after all these years? Well, let's look at the couple of criteria to answer those questions. First of all, they said that the new unicameral would be more open to inspection by and input from the people, largely because of its simple structure and small size. Nothing in that structure or size has changed dramatically. In the 60s, we added a few more uh, senators. We're up to 49, but that's not a huge change. We still have no conference committees. We have no other house to blame things on. All the lawmaking is done in one room, and senators themselves and any observer can sit there and watch the whole thing happen. Sessions on the floor and in committee are open to the public. So yes, our legislature is still pretty open and transparent. And one of the things that they wrote into the rules that very first session was that every bill would get a public hearing advertised in advance. That's still part of the rules in the legislature. Every single bill gets a public hearing. Anybody can go and testify. So a senator doesn't have to be part of the majority party to get a bill in front of colleagues in the public. And no committee chair can just disappear something that he or she doesn't want to deal with. Every bill will be considered and people will come and testify for and against it. And also, because the size is still small, someone who really wants to get involved with legislation can contact all 49 senators in person. I mean, it's not impossible. I, I mean, it looks like it might be because you're all busy, but us retired people, we could do that anyway. And people know who their legislators are. And we're still nonpartisan, which keeps the senators more responsive to the people. I have heard this from senators. I've heard it from other observers. Now, some critics have said that party labels on the ballot would make it easier for voters to make their choice. You know, if there were an R or a D behind these names, which there isn't for the legislature, then if you didn't know something much about this person, you could at least kind of guess which direction he or she would lean on every issue, or most issues. So there, maybe there's a, a place for that, but almost nobody thinks that having party discipline and structure in the body itself would be an improvement, except the state's Republican and Democratic parties, of course, who would love it. Um, now, some people say, the unicameral might be nonpartisan in name, but come on, we know, we know, the senators all vote along party lines, but the senators themselves vehemently disagree. Think about it this way. Every senator, except the one registered independent, is registered Republican or Democrat. And so you will see people fall out along general philosophical lines, which you might expect, right? But that doesn't mean that the party is telling them how to vote. There are no party leaders in the unicameral. There is no party hierarchy. There is no party discipline as such. I think, though, that lately, citizens and the media have been paying a lot more attention to how, to what party affiliation the various senators have. And I think term limits have something to do with that, and we'll talk a little more about term limits at the end. So voting coalitions in the unicameral are, by definition, not partisan, not organized by party apparatus and party discipline. Unlike every other legislative body in the country, our unicameral does not meet on the first day or two of the session 
to elect a speaker, a majority leader, majority whip, minority leader, or other party-based leadership positions. Senators do not, thus, take marching orders from the party. A story in the Daily Beast, which is an online publication focused on politics a couple years ago, described the structure of the unicameral as making weird alliances and inter-party strategizing the norm, not the exception. And the story portrayed that as a very good thing. A political scientist quoted in this story said that the structure, quote, fosters a culture of people voting their conscience rather than by politics. And that was also portrayed as a good thing. So coalitions sometimes form on the basis of a rural-urban split, a business not so pro-business division, a geographic division, or just a division of interests and ideologies. But those coalitions shift from one bill to the next. And that means almost inevitably there's going to be some log rolling and vote trading going on. Um, you know, I, I really need your vote on this, and if you can vote with me, Mike, then on the next bill that you really care about, I'll, I'll support you. But that's a lot different than a, a vote that's in a decision that's instigated by the uh, party leadership. These, these votes are, are solicited by the sponsor the bill sponsor and the core group supporting it, not by the party. This means that senators are all relatively equal. Nobody has a whole lot more power than anybody else by virtue of party position or seniority, which also doesn't officially count. You can't, you can't serve on a committee in the unicameral for two, three years and assume you're gonna move up and become the chair. Seniority does not officially count. One position that has gotten stronger over the years, though, is that of speaker. In the early sessions, the speaker had almost no power at all. He, and it's always been a he, was just the figurehead. Nobody else had much power either. The committee chairs a little bit, but not much. They were deliberately trying to keep everybody on an equal footing, which is commendable in theory, but it really makes it hard to get things done. If you've ever been part of a group that formed around a cause or a goal or a, a, you know, a need that, to be met, you know how you all sat around and looked at each other until finally somebody said, okay, I'll take the lead. Oh, good, now we're going to make progress, right? You have to have some of that leadership. As the legislative workload, workload got heavier over the years, the unicameral began to strengthen the position of speaker. And they, they kind of were dragged into it, kicking and fighting. I mean, this was against the, the innate feeling of equality that the body instills in its members. So now the speaker can set the agenda and can designate some super priority bills. And you've, if you've been following this in the paper um, recently, you saw the stories about the arguments over how many hours of debate should be allowed before we move on to the next bill. The speaker can decide that sort of thing, but the speaker still can't say, we'll debate this for four hours and then we'll vote. He can say, we'll debate this for four hours and then we'll move to the next topic. There's a big difference there. Well, the committee chairs and the executive board are the other positions of power in the legislature, but they're not very powerful either, a little bit more than they used to be, but not much. So as a result of this formal leveling process, the body has to rely on other ways to find leadership. And one of the most valued is knowledge about an issue. When I surveyed the senators in 2001 for the first edition of, of One House, they said that the most knowledgeable senators, not the most senior or the most ideologically pure, become the body's leaders. And I heard that again when I talked to senators for the second edition of the book a few years later. Well, quite a few years later. Um, that really echoes the populist and progressive philosophy that underpins this institution. Norris and the others wanted independent members, weak leadership, and rules that gave everybody plenty of voice. They wanted knowledge and expertise to supplant party loyalty. And I would say to a great extent, those goals have been met and continue to stay in force today. So let's look real briefly at a few other goals. One reason that the unicameral has been able to keep its members on pretty equal footing 
is that it has embraced that progressive idea that experts and specialists can help the government work better for the people. This was something Norris really pushed. And the addition of staff at all levels has helped to make that possible. There are aides for individual senators and for committees. And there's a legislative research office, a fiscal office, an audit office, and a bill drafter. On the criterion of good pay, though, the legislature is still way behind. Both pay for staff and pay for senators themselves. And I think George Norris, the good progressive, would be disappointed. He put those dollars into the amendment thinking that that would guarantee a decent salary, not thinking about how hard it is to change the Constitution every time you want to give your legislators a raise. It's just tough. Um, they haven't had a, an increase in pay since 1987 when we decided they could have $12,000 a year. That's way below minimum wage, way below, because this is not a part-time job, even though it might look like it. You know, 60 days and 90 days? No, they're on the job almost all the time. Um, in 2012, we tried to raise it, and the um, amendment failed. So it's really tough, that, since it's in the Constitution. And you can, my grandfather was from Fall City, Nebraska. And I mean, and this was years ago. And I was saying, you know, we need to pay these senators more so they could do more. And he said, well, maybe if they do something, we'd pay them more. Well, that's one way of looking at it, I suppose. And, and it was my grandpa for sure. Um, he would have been real comfortable with that constitution that just tried to keep government cheap. At any rate, it's difficult for most people, most ordinary people, to be state senators when the job is as demanding as it is and the pay is so low. One more factor to consider, the influence of lobbyists in this unique legislative structure. Lobbyists had a really bad name in the 1930s, not that they've got a really good name now. Um, many citizens saw them as representatives of the wealthy elite sneaking around and trying to help their clients at the expense of the real people. Norris said this proposed unicameral could change that. For one thing, because it would be small, it would be hard for lobbyists to hide. And because it was nonpartisan, lobbyists couldn't just go to the party leaders and persuade them to get their members in line and vote the way the lobbyists recommended. Best of all, though, the new unicameral would have no conference committees where, Norris said, laws were made in secret, which was pretty much true. In his model legislature speech, he said that, Norris said, that lobbyists had told him the easiest legislature to control was one with lots of members because in a case like that, in a big body, in a partisan body, you had to have a few leaders that were going to really have a lot of clout. So all a lobbyist needed to do was convince those few people to get their troops in line, and that was all they needed. In a small body with no party leadership, the lobbyists would have to convince a majority of the entire group to support their point of view. Norris had no use for lobbyists. His friend John Senning took a slightly different point of view. Like most political scientists today, Senning recognized the valuable role that lobbyists can play, providing information, representing the legitimate interests of ordinary people, sometimes in conflict with the legitimate interests of other ordinary people. After all, lobbying is the primary way that most people exercise their First Amendment right of petition. I mean, there are groups out there representing farmers, teachers, doctors, your truck drivers, your interests are represented by at least one group that's lobbying on your behalf, one place or another. So lobbying goes on today under far more scrutiny and regulation than it did in the 1930s. I'm not sure Norris would be happy about that, but I think he'd just have to live with it. One thing I'm sure would make him happy though, he'd be thrilled that the mandated hearing on every bill is still in place. Because if that were not required, a lobbyist could work with a committee chair and just kind of make some legislation disappear. That is not possible here 
where every bill has to be put out for public debate. Doesn't mean every bill is going to make it to the floor of the legislature for consideration by the whole body, but it will have a public hearing, guaranteed. Now, just a quick word about term limits and their effect on the legislature. In 2012, the University, University of Nebraska Press published a second edition of One House that includes a chapter on term limits effects. And the interviews that I did with current and former senators and lobbyists and the analysis of what's actually happened in the unicameral suggested that the legislature as an institution may be growing weaker. Here are a couple of factors I identified. The governor and political parties and special interest groups have begun to take advantage of the large number of inexperienced senators. Remember, every two years, we're electing maybe a third of the senators that are brand new to this small body of 49 people. The parties and the interest groups have a lot more experience. The governor has a high profile. And they can exert a lot more of their own influence on a group where nobody has been there more than eight years. Nobody. Some of them only four years, you know, and they decide not to run again. But most of them stay the eight, but that's it. So the governor, the interest groups, the lobbyists might be able to, and the parties, influence policy more easily than in the past. And here's another observation about term limits. At every level of government in the US, it is hard to defeat an incumbent. The incumbent has a huge advantage, name recognition, um, a record, you know, having been out to breakfast with a lot of constituents. So potential candidates are likely to wait until an incumbent decides not to run again and a seat is open. Well, this two-term limit on service in the legislature means that we always know when a seat's going to be open. Again, as, you know, as I said, a few people decide not to run for a second term, but most do. But then they're done. That seat will be open. And the parties and the special interests can spend time recruiting and grooming and supporting candidates who they believe will strongly advance their positions. And if those candidates win, they are likely to feel some link to the party or the interests that help them get elected. I am not implying anything corrupt here. I don't mean that. But there's a stronger shared interest, I think, than there used to be. Because everybody has, every seat comes open at least every eight years. And I think the result is a more partisan spirit in the legislature. Two years ago, you might remember, when um, a big flock of freshmen entered the legislature, we had a real hoo-ha about electing how we're going to elect committee chairs. This has always been done on a written secret ballot. The reason being, even though that goes against this whole concept of transparency, right? But the reason being that that way, nobody's going to come back at you and say, hey, you didn't vote for the right person here. He's not your party. She's not part of this group. So we had a big hoopla about that, and also a, a whole couple months of wrangling over the rules, which also influenced, I think, the party spirit in there, the nonpartisan spirit in the legislature. I think it feels like things have moderated a little bit again. Partly, we probably just elected a bunch of more moderate people last fall. But I also think that maybe some of those people who were so involved with that upheaval a couple years ago might have heard the calls to respect the institution and the benefits of nonpartisanship and backed off a little bit. At least I hope that's the case. So to wrap up, we just got to admit that the unicameral is not perfect. Even if it has a profoundly effective structure, and thoughtfully designed rules, no institution is perfect. But ours does pretty well, even after all these 80 years. And Nebraskans overwhelmingly like the way their legislature is structured and the way it functions. A poll of Nebraskans in 2015 showed that a stunning 62% approved of the legislature's work and only 26% disapproved. That's a big margin. 
Uh, the other 12% apparently weren't paying attention because they didn't have an opinion. Um, two items I sponsored on the NASIS survey, the Nebraska Annual Social Indicators Survey poll in 2017, indicated that closer to 50% may not be paying attention because they didn't have an opinion. But let's look at those who did. In response to this statement, the Nebraska legislature should return to a two-house partisan body. Only 12% of the total respondents agreed. 41% disagreed. Then there was this statement. Nebraska's legislature seems to work better than two house legislatures in other states. Only 7% disagreed with that. And 41% said, yes, it does work better. We agree. So Nebraskans who are paying attention think, tend to think our model works well and shouldn't be changed. I think George Norris would be really proud of the institution he helped to create and the way it's continued to function through the decades. And I think we should be too. And thank you for listening. I snuck into the back. Good afternoon, I am Jamie Reimer. It's my pleasure to serve as the chair of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln Research Council. Thank you for being here this afternoon. And thank you to our speaker for an enlightening discussion this afternoon. If you have any questions about our unicameral or related topics, I'm sure she would be happy to entertain them now. So during the discussions in the 30s of going to uni the unicameral, were there discussions on how long a term would be? Was there controversy about whether, how many years a person would serve? No, there really wasn't. Um, at that time, terms were two years only, and the legislature met only every other year. That was true under the bicameral up to that point, and it was true under the new unicameral up to the 60s, when they changed the terms to four years um, and decided they better meet every year because the pace of change had increased and they, they needed to stay up with things. So. Um, it really wasn't part of the discussion at the time. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have, I wondered if any other states have had movements trying to follow our model to create a one house legislature. Yeah, they have actually, and I've got that here someplace. I, it's either 12, sorry, I should just find it, shouldn't I? It was either 12 or 15 states during the 20s and, and early 30s that in some way raised the question of a unicameral. Sometimes it was the governor who mentioned it in a speech, this is something we should consider. Or a bill was introduced but it didn't get very far. Or there was just a, you know, a, a group of citizens who brought the idea forward but again it didn't go anywhere. Now South Dakota tried just a couple of years ago to go to a one house legislature, not nonpartisan, but one house, and it failed. So um, I, I think it's interesting that George Norris did not recommend that the US Congress should be converted to one house. He thought that <clears throat> the, the national legislature represented too many different interests. This is not a populist idea. I mean, because populism would say, hey, the whole nation's got one unitary interest, right? Um, he jumped off the populist bandwagon at that point and didn't think that the Congress should switch. Um, other states, I, I don't know why other states don't. I mean, think about the states which are low population, lower population than we are, and yet have two houses which which caused all the problems, you know, that, that Norris was trying to get away from. And I don't know that there's a big advantage to that. The one thing that somebody did mention to me once that I thought was surely worth considering is, he said, you know, I'm, the trouble with one house is that if I go to my senator and I don't get any satisfaction from her, I don't have anywhere else to go. If there were two houses, I could go to, you know, my representative in the other house. Well, yeah, you could, but we don't. <laughs> Thanks so much, Charlene. Um, as we're looking back on the first 150 years as being a university, this was really insightful, I think. 
I'd like you to look forward now, maybe to our next 150. Mm -hmm. What challenges to the unicameral or changes in the unicameral do you predict may happen over the coming decades? Wow. Um, I, I don't. I don't know how it's going to turn out, but I think the struggle to maintain that nonpartisan um, spirit, the nonpartisan commitment, is going to be tested over and over for the reasons I said, term limits being right there at the top of the list. And also communication, I'm sorry, communication being so instant now. And um, I don't see that, I don't see that anybody in our legislature is using Twitter the way some politicians in this country are. But it's possible, you know, and, and it's easy to go from moderate to extreme really fast in that case. I do think, though, as I said, I'm comforted by what I see as a kind of a return to a loyalty to the nonpartisan, to the institution. Um, and I have to say, Senator Laura Ebke, who was a, a, we were in grad school together. We disagree on pretty much 90% of policy issues, but man, I admire her for her commitment to the institution of the unicameral. She was a real institutionalist. She respected the nonpartisanship, she respected the rules, the openness, the, and it's not that nobody else does, but she just stands out in my mind as somebody who really was willing to lay it on the line. And um, unfortunately, she didn't get reelected. But I, but I think there's, there's, I hope, more of that in the legislature again as we kind of rebound from some of the major uh, tests and threats. Charlene, I'm curious about, you talked about the original 1937 unicameral having 43 senators, yeah. I think you said. And at one point that changed to 49 mm -hmm. that we currently have today. I think it was just one change, it wasn't a multiple. Right. So do you see any challenges for the unicameral, you mentioned rural urban, and there's a lot of conversation about that currently at a national level as well. Yeah. Is the, how did they come about the 43 to 49? What, what made that change at that time and do you foresee any uh, possibilities in that regard? Yeah, in the 60s um, was when all that happened, when we went to meeting every year to the four-year terms and so forth. There was a real, the population had grown enough, I believe, that people were, um, saw the need to respond more quickly. And, and we also reapportioned, and as you might remember, all of you, I'm sure you do in some way or another, that it was not mandatory that state legislatures had to be apportioned according to population in the 30s when we became a unicameral, but we did. We, they apportioned those districts as, you know, as close as they could to equal population and keeping the urban-rural balance. In the 60s, a couple of really high-profile Supreme Court cases, Baker v. Carr and a few others, made it mandatory that you will apportion according to population. You have no choice. The only body exempt from that is the United States Senate. And that's a historical thing. Um, so we have to stay with that kind of apportionment. Now in Nebraska, that means, of course, that senators with equal numbers or almost equal numbers of constituents have gigantically different geographical areas to which they are responsible. And that can be a problem. And it could be that if we expanded the legislature, added, just added some more people, 10 more maybe, um, we could reduce some of that burden on the rural legislators who have a hard time getting from one end of their district to the other. Um, but that would take a constitutional amendment. And a few years ago, somebody did produ uh, propose that. I can't think who it was, but it didn't go anywhere. I think was here. Thank you, that was a fascinating lecture. I have a question, if you could build more the context, the historical context, when this debate was happening with George Norris. Was there an extensive debate within the university? Was there wider participation or was it just a few individuals? And uh, a second part of that will be, do you think that 
the unicameral and this unique way of, of governing has really um, uh, provided a broader support for the university over time. Hmm. As far as I know, from the research that I did, the university didn't have a position on this. I don't think they would have dared to, you know, for, I don't know, legally, but certainly politically. Um, but John Sunning was, you know, right there, right next to Norris through the whole thing. And um, he was very involved in the drawing of the districts, you know, when they reapportioned for the one house and so forth. And I'm sure there were other individuals, too, who took part in that movement, but I don't have any details, I'm sorry. And now I can't remember the other part of your question. The second part was whether this unique approach to government oh. has really benefited the university. Hmm. That's an interesting idea. What has this, is this better for the university than a two-house body? Um, wow, I don't know. I, I don't think it's hurt us. I, I mean, I think that, and maybe this is true in land-grant schools all over, but the people of Nebraska really think this is their university, by gosh, I and mean, it's mine, and my kid better go there if he wants to, right? Um, it's my legislature, and I know who my senator is, and I can go there, and, and I think maybe the the two things have complemented each other in that people are more involved, more aware of what's going on. That's probably a benefit sometimes and maybe not other times. Um, certainly the goal that the legislature would be more efficient and able to move more quickly should benefit the university, I think. Um, but I haven't studied it to know, to be able to give you any data that would indicate whether it has. So. Sorry. Um, so throughout the entire lecture, there's been a lot of discussion um, of, you know, on paper, um, the idea of the unicameral being um, nonpartisan um, and without um, influence um, of any one political party. Obviously, that um, is never entirely true in practice. Um, you mentioned one senator in particular um, that had a particular allegiance um, to the institution of the unicameral and its ideal form. Um, but I was wondering if you could maybe provide some more insight um, through you know, your, your meetings with state legislatures and what you've been able to observe um, over the past couple of years and to um, kind of the degree to which partisanship is still an issue, um, how uh, much state parties are actually able to influence um, individual senators um, and kind of to what degree that is actually prevalent um, regardless of what the ideal form of the unicameral law should actually be. Well, it, as I said, I think term limits have made a big difference in that regard. Um, you know, you're gonna, even if it's just sat in the back of your head, you're gonna dance with the person who brung you, right? And if you got lots and lots of help being elected from a p political party, I, I don't mean they've paid you off. I don't mean that, because I don't think that's happening but you certainly would be inclined to listen. And the reason you've been recruited in the first place is because the party saw you as somebody whose views align with theirs. This is true in both parties. I'm not, you know, there's no villain and hero here. Um, so yeah, I think that that really, probably more than anything else, the term limits have had a, uh, made, the, made a leap in that threat to nonpartisanship. Um, we've had some governors who are outstandingly effective politicians and they again because you've got inexperienced senators or at least that makes it more obvious um, the governor has been able to do his best to influence the legislature we've interestingly you know that when they passed a couple of very controversial bills the governor vetoed the legislature turned around and overrode the veto in several instances. So they're not just lying down and playing dead by any means. Um, but then you have a, you know, we had the referendum then on the death penalty and that's another whole story. Next question here. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to know, um, what do you think of the Ernie Chambers and the role he's had in the unicameral shaping the, the institution? That's interesting. 
Um, I think Senator Chambers is an institutionalist. I mean, I really do. I think he really values the institution of the legislature, really respects it. He is famous for knowing the rules better than anybody else and using them to his advantage. I think he's a voice that needs to be heard, absolutely needs to be heard. Can he frustrate the process? Yes, he sure can. And there are times when we'd all probably just assume that he'd stop doing that. But he represents people whose voice needs to be there. And so he does that in the way that seems to him most effective. It's been interesting that he chose that path, you know, to be on his own, an outlier, not to work within the system so much, but, um, but I think he, he probably would stand up here and defend this one house nonpartisan thing as much as I do. Charlene, a, couple, a few years ago there was, uh, on, a, on the ballot was the op option of increasing the number of terms to three, yeah. as well as, I think it was the same year to raise the annual salary of yeah. senators, and both were voted down pretty strongly. How do you square that up in terms of Nebraskans kind of populist bent? Um, yeah, we, people have said that, you know, it was, you're talking about the term limits, increasing the number of terms to three, and increasing the salary. And maybe putting those both on the ballot at the same time was not such a good idea. Um, strategically, it might have been better to go with one or the other and then you know, come back later. How does that square with populism? Hmm. I, I don't think it does. I mean, I think the, the term limits are not a populist notion. Well, maybe they are. I mean, because populists think that the legislature is the pass-through for me, right? We, I, us, the people, should be able to make our will known through the legislature. And they just listen to what we say, and then they do it, because we are a unitary people. Now, hardly anybody is that pure a populist, but that idea can really influence the way people look at their legislature and legislators, I think. The money is just a crying shame. It's just, I, I don't know. I, I think people, they're like my grandpa, you know, if they do something, maybe we'd pay them more. I don't think they're aware of how much work is involved in being a legislator, and I don't think they've taken that step of thinking about, okay, well, you don't like it that the elites are in the legislature. Well, who else can afford to? I mean, the people that are there are not all big, wealthy folks by any means, but you've got to have an independent source of income or you can't do this. And even the people with, I mean, they're making a sacrifice to do this. So, and they're getting paid hardly anything. Um, so you got to think maybe they have a sense of public service. Why else would you do it? And even if you disagree with them, even if you don't like their, their philosophies and their policies, why else would they do this unless they thought that they have an idea that somebody should consider for the sake of the people and the state? So. Were there any other questions this afternoon? Last one. on your list of heroes of the unicameral. Hmm. Yes. Um, Senator John Norton was the chair of the Rules Committee. And I think he was a hero. He, um, you know, the, the, the big thing was this required hearing on every bill that they put into the rules. That's, a, that's huge. That just is not the case in, in so many states. So that was a big thing. And, and Norton really, they were trying when they wrote those first rules to make everybody equal. You know, they really they wanted weak leadership. They wanted everybody to have a chance to talk to represent this body of the people looking over their shoulders. And he did an excellent job in the in the legislature of making that happen. And of course, as I said, some of it we've had to back away from because of changing times. And even at the time, they started out with a committee of the whole. Every bill was brought to the committee of the whole where the, the presiding officer steps down, you know, they all just talk about it. 
They don't take any action. Then they reconvene as the legislature and they make a decision. Or they talk about some more and then they make a decision. Well, they thought they were going to be out of here in no time. This was going to be so much more efficient. They were here until the end of June. And people <laughs> were getting, these were farmers, a lot of them, you know, and they couldn't get home to plant their crops. This was not going to work. So they had to oh, you know, almost immediately start pulling back from that a little bit. But Norton really knew how to make that, the system work to the goals that the, the people behind the amendment had in mind. So I'd say he's a, a hero. I think John Senning's a hero too, because he was very involved with kind of helping them shepherd, shepherd things along through, those first, through that first session. So go UNL, right? So thank you so much. This is really fun. Well, please join me in thanking Charlene Greg for a wonderful, enlightening presentation on our unicameral. And as a token to our, our lecturers, we have a framed print of the Nebraska lecture for you, Charlene, so as a token of our appreciation and for something to remember this time, enjoy that. Another round of applause for Charlene.